Thank you very much for joining our second episode of the Invest in Africa webinar series. Are you a business owner, investor, banker, academic, policymaker, or compliance professional with interest in Africa? Then the Invest in Africa webinar series brought to you by EBII Compliance is for you. Africa is generally described as the next frontier. It would be good to hear from you uh, the kind of due diligence that you would advise our audience to pay attention to. The Invest in Africa webinar series brings you a monthly expert panel and live Q&A session focused on compliance issues with practical solutions around investing in Africa. We cannot paint with the same brush every country in Africa. Develop your investment strategy, learn about the risk involved, and uncover the wealth of opportunities in the world's fastest growing region. Understand the environment in which you are operating. The Invest in Africa webinar series, changing investors' perception of risk in Africa. So thank you uh, to my panel and to the attendees for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to the implementation challenges and opportunities for the African continental free trade area post COVID-19 webinar. So underpinning any investment decision should be a very clear understanding of the risk of the proposition under consideration, which requires due diligence if an investor is to succeed in dynamic Africa. This is also key to unlocking the region's potential and opportunities. So the Invest in Africa series are aimed at helping these global market participants appropriately rate the risk in Africa, as this will make it easier to access those markets. The program is being run by EBI Compliance, which is part of EBI I Group. Now EBI Compliance serves as an emerging market interface for businesses in the Western world and Sub-Saharan Africa. Ultimately, we aim to demystify the risk associated with a Sub-Saharan Africa, providing real insights to investors through regularly held conferences, compliance training programs, and due diligence reports, among others. I am Ajoa Ejechum, the founder and CEO of Emerging Business Intelligence and Innovations Group, an intellect in African economic development, and I am the moderator for this series. The African continental free trade area is said to be the world's largest free trade area by a number of countries once it's fully up and running. The goal is to establish a single market for goods and services across 54 countries that would allow the free movement of people and investment. This will also help create common rules and harmonious regulations which are currently lacking on the continent to ensure that the flow of goods and services happens far more quickly and easily. The creation of a single market is predicted to generate 3.4 trillion in combined output for the continent of Africa. Now COVID-19 presents implementation challenges and also raises new opportunities. This week His Excellency Wamkele Mene, who is the secretary, the new secretary um, for the trade agreement, uh, says Africa um, continental free trade area will be Africa's recovery plan. Currently, the start of the trading is scheduled for the 1st of July. And of course, many are asking, how does this affect, um, many are asking, how does COVID-19 impact Africa? Today, I have with me Michael Cotto, uh, Dr. Richard Eddie Jemfi, and also Collins Ajiman Sapan. Now, Michael is a co-author and a president, sorry, co-author and project director of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement Year Zero Report by Afro Champions. He's also the managing partner at the international research and advisory firm Confident. Also with me is Dr. Richard Edijemfi, who is a consultant at the International Trade Center Geneva. Richard is also the co-author of the recent Afro Champion Africa Year Zero Report released early this May, early May this year. Also with me is Mr. Collins Ajeman Sapa. Mr. Collins is the president of Ghana's Institute of Procurement and Supply. He has worked as the head of procurement and supply chains management for the UNDP, American Embassy, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, just to name a few. So over the next two minutes, I'm gonna to go to my um, panelists to give us 
just a one minute summary of what they are going to um, add uh, to the conversation, what they bring into the conversation, uh, the value that they'll bring to the conversation. So I'm going to go straight to Mr. Collins um, Adaman Sapon. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Um, it's nice uh, coming together to talk about this issue. What I think that the reason why I'm here is that uh, one of the sectors that have been hugely, hugely impacted is uh, supply chain management. And therefore, as part of the panel, I'm going to bring on the table the impact on supply chain, the economic uh, development of the various countries, Africa and across the world, and how um, after COVID, how economies are going to uh, fast track and develop as against some weaknesses in the area of financial trade and uh, money laundering and how people can take advantage of the system because of what uh, is happening to every economy and uh, how um, because of the downturn in the economy how every country will be rushing to have a cake of the world's resources fantastic thank you very much for that introduction uh, so i'll go to uh, mr richard uh, dr richard eddie jemphy to give us another one minute uh, in intro of what he brings to the conversation this afternoon. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Adwa. Yeah, so um, my name is once more Richard Edwinfi, and um, I work as a, a business and economic development expert. I uh, have been working with ITC on um, trade um, in, in, in relation to SME work. Yeah, so uh, given my recent involvement in so many works on AFC, AFT, uh, I bring with a discussion Who's concerned um, countries in preparedness commitment towards the AFCFTA and how the private sector itself could also be very influential in AFCFTA. So basically, this will be my, my contribution, SME, trade, and then regional integration. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And over to you, Michael Kotov. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adjoa, and uh, greetings to uh, all our attendees. Um, in our part of the world who have joined us today. It's a pleasure to join all of you. Um, as my colleague panelists have said, uh, there's, these are really special times uh, everywhere in the world. And Africa definitely is having its share of the impact of COVID. Um, and, and so we're looking forward to having a discussion around uh, what the future looks like, uh, what the rest of the year looks like in the context of opportunities and threats and what Africans can do coming together to accelerate post-COVID recovery. So I'm looking forward to having a, a very productive discussion and, and also looking forward to hearing the questions and contributions from our attendees who have joined us. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And uh, since uh, you just finished speaking, I'll, I'll go straight to you <laughs> with the first question. And so again, uh, Michael, you and Richard, you have both been involved in writing the AFTA Year Zero report and country rankings by the Afro champions. How is COVID-19 impacting this whole African continental free trade agreement preparedness? Thank you. Uh, thank you. So as, as we all probably are aware, July 1st, 2020 uh, was, it's a very, it was a very special year on the African calendar until COVID struck. We're all very much looking forward to the formal start of trade of, of, of after, and then COVID struck, and, and it's disrupted a lot of that preparedness. What the year zero CFTA, year zero report sought to do was to do an assessment of how COVID was impacting countries' preparedness, but also to weigh the extent to which countries were ready and committed to the process. Uh, there, there are three main ways in which COVID has disrupted the preparedness to us after a uh, start of trade. The first one is that before the July start of trade could formally happen, three things were supposed to happen. The after secretariat, which is being hosted in Accra, was supposed to officially open in March 2020. 
because of COVID, that has not happened. So recruitment of staff uh, to, uh, to man the office and operationalize it has not happened. Uh, the Secretary General, Wamkele, has been officially sworn in, but he's operating temporarily out of Addis Ababa. So, so the after secretariat has not formally operationalized, and that's, that's one disruption. The second disruption is that the after negotiations are still ongoing in phases. And one crucial phase was supposed to be completed before July 1. And as a result of COVID, the country negotiation teams are not able to travel to meet and complete the negotiations. Two very crucial negotiations that are necessary before the start of trade can start. One of them is the negotiations around the rules of origin. Uh, another one is the agreement around the tariff concessions uh, from the various countries two extremely crucial negotiations that should be in place before start of trade can start. Unfortunately, that has not been completed. And then the third one is that when these uh, negotiations were completed, they were supposed to be submitted officially to the extraordinary summit of heads of states, which was supposed to happen in Johannesburg in June. That too, obviously cannot happen because of COVID. So these are ways in which COVID has severely disrupted the preparedness towards the start of trade and African governments are still in discussions uh, to make a decision on exactly what to do ahead of the July 1st uh, date. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Richard, I know you were also part of this report. I'd like to hear from you as well. Thank you. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you also. Um, I would say governments at the moment uh, are very much focused on trying to they can so to say redeem their 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 countries from from this uh, havoc created by um, the COVID. So there is more attention towards looking at health. There's more attention towards looking at how um, um, protective equipment, how sanitizers, or anything which actually try to match the situation. As we all know, at the moment there is no vaccine yet so governments in africa have, have turned attention towards the more than than more than than on trade so it leaves a bit of a gap or space as to how prepared they are for the 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 after the afc fta and that to me is is a bit worrying in the sense that we all do understand that this is quite necessary but we also need trade to be able to fight this COVID in in, in many ways because we can trade in PPEs that is protect personal protective equipment. We can trade in sanitizers. We can trade in in a mask. We can trade in so many pharmaceutical or medicine medicinal products which will help us contain this um, COVID. And and that is one thing which uh, I think that uh, COVID is really disrupting the preparedness because it is shifting course away from what it can really do in terms of combating it than managing. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So basically, I think from what I understand from the two of you is that COVID is really shifting the attention of these um, nations, the African uh, countries that um, have been very excited about uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's shifting their, all their resources and attention from um, going ahead in terms of um, carrying on with a level of excitement uh, to solving the health crisis that is currently um, affecting the continent. So thank you for that. And I, I, I again, back to you, Richard. Um, the, the next question to you is that, uh, do you see COVID-19 derailing this whole African continental uh, free trade agreement, um, uh, the, the starts uh, of the trading? So it's meant to be starting on the 1st of July. Uh, do you see COVID-19 mm -hmm. affecting the start and to what extent as well, if you can give some examples? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, as to as to how COVID is uh, really derailing or going to derail, with, I'm sorry, um, the start of trade, is I would say it's probably not an issue of COVID itself, but as to how um, the actors, that is the government, the private sector, are able to deal uh, deal with the situation. I would say, um, we believe at uh, Afro Champions, so to say, the, the from the AFCT as a report which we give that uh, we can be, we can go on the offensive and then we can go on the, def the on the defensive as well. 
And when I say offensive, it's that I come back again to the issue of training in protective or medicinal or medicine or pharmaceutical products, you see. And um, going on the defensive is uh, opening up our borders to accept these pharmaceutical or medicinal products, so to say, you see. Um, if you're able to do this, then COVID will not derail the start because we already have this mechanism in, in mind. Um, July 1st was supposed to be uh, not only the implementation where it start of trade, but it was also a significant moment for, for the private sector. So that we see that now the man, the battle or, or the, man, the baton has now been handed over to the private sector to start the trade. As we all know, the AFCFTA is basically for the private sector. I mean, the SME, the small and medium-sized enterprises, women, youth-led enterprises, and of course, the big enterprises as well. Uh, and for them, business is, 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 their, is their way of life. And so if there's an opportunity to extend into the African market, uh, making the African market just one single market, and then because of COVID, it is now slowing down or derailing their chances, um, there's something, something really needs to be done. And for me, it is not really COVID itself because I see it as a micro microscopic uh, pathogen which is disrupted, but it is how we actually respond to this, which is we are the, the, the government, uh, the SM is the private sector, I mean, yeah, the women, the, the institutions, all this, we have to now stand our ground and say, and, and we have to control COVID and not COVID controlling us. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I completely agree with you, and um, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, before we carry on with the further questions, I've got a poll here, and just to engage with our audience a little bit more. Um, so, I'm asking the question, I'm launching a poll, and the question is, do you think your country will benefit from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? I'd love the audience to answer this, and, and we can see what the answers are before we carry on. Okay, so do I go ahead? Because now I can see that uh, uh, everyone is paused, but I'm, only, I'm the only one online now. Could, could I go on? Um, yeah, you can go on. Uh, you can go on while people are also answering the question. I think the answers should be should be coming in shortly. Okay. Yes. All right. I mean, um, uh, every free trade agreement should be able to benefit which player is involved in it. Otherwise, then it is not a it is even a negative sum game. I would say, uh, particularly. If, if it regards to my country, Ghana, yes, of course, uh, we have a, a lot of, we can produce a lot of uh, products which can be traded across the continent. Uh, the whole idea is to move away from the commodity-based uh, economy. That is where we produce gold, coffee, cocoa, just in their raw form and export outside the continent. But there are, for example, other, other products like pineapple, which can be processed, manufactured in a way that can be distributed across the continent. And every African country, some way, somehow, have uh, has a, a comparative advantage. That is, they, are, they have a, a resources within their, their, their geographical borders. Yes. Um, it's actually up to the country now to see how they would be able to uh, um, use this opportunity to, to increase value addition or to bring in value addition on the products where they, are, uh, they, have, competitive, they have comparative advantage. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other aspect would be a competitive advantage. That is how they are able to combine, for example, human resources, innovation in a way that is unique to them so that they can be competitive. Yeah, but at the same time, you should say that on the continent, yeah, we are looking at competition, but at the same time, we are looking at cooperation. And that is why the AFCFTA is there, because the AFCFTA making a single market is to help us trade, not to outdo one, outdo one, one, other, one another, but um, to, to increase or to to push our chances of becoming good, a good, good economies where we can sustain ourselves. So my country will benefit, but saying that is just very simple. But it can benefit only when it applies itself in a way that makes it unique. Fantastic. So uh, this is also a poll that uh, went out. We've got uh, about close to sixty percent have voted so far. So so far, uh, we've got twenty-five percent saying they strongly agree that uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will benefit their country. We've got 69% saying they agree, 6% saying neutral, 
and then zero percent disagree and zero strongly agree. So I think by the look of things, it looks like the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will benefit uh, almost everybody on this on this uh, webinar, all our attendees for so far, from what I gather. Awesome, thank you for that. The next question um, is going to go to. The next question is going to go to uh, Michael again. So, Michael, are all the African countries enthusiastic about this whole uh, this African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, initiative? Can you give examples of commitment versus readiness level, and what could be the impact for the uh, trade agreement? Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Adria. So, in the CFT is a report that we published. What we sought to do, one of the things we sought to do was to measure, to try to measure and rank uh, 55 African countries according to their levels of commitment and their levels of readiness for uh, the takeoff of the CFTA. And, and so we came up with certain indicators that were used uh, to measure commitment of the countries. Um, some of those indicators were, for example, whether the country has signed and ratified the agreement. But in addition to that, we also wanted to look at the country's commitment to other complementary measures for CFTA, such as free movement of people in the continent and the country's visa openness. Um, so we use indicators like that to measure countries' commitments, and, and we did a ranking and, and a scoring for that. Um, and then on, on preparedness, we we came up with indicators to measure the country's implementation capacity. So we looked at indicators such as the country's trade facilitation readiness, uh, customs efficiency, trade infrastructure, access to trade finance, uh, logistics uh, capabilities, trade logistics capabilities, and a host of other indicators uh, to measure and see if CFT is started today. Uh, these indicators tell you the country's implementation capacity. And, and we, 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 we ranked all 55 countries. The picture that emerged was, was quite fascinating. Rwanda emerged as the most committed country to the CFTA process, uh, followed by um, a, a, a host of other countries. And I think that uh, we, we can probably share a link to the report so that our attendees can, uh, can, can download a copy of the report and look at it in detail. But, Rwanda, for example, emerged as, as the most committed country. In, in terms of implementation capacity, South Africa emerged as the country with the best implementation capacity. Uh, those are just, you know, the top examples. In the report, we've ranked all the countries and we showed the top 10 countries and the bottom 10, as well as all the 55 rankings. Now, what will interest uh, 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 people to know this we wanted to know what the overall commitment level for the com continent is like, and what overall preparedness capacity of the com continent is like. And the worrying outcome was that if you looked at the continent as a whole, overall preparedness was slightly below 50%. And overall commitment was also slightly below 50%. So we all are very enthusiastic about the AFCFT. There's a lot of enthusiasm. We're all working towards it. But if you try to look at the elements that define whether a particular country is committed or ready, and if you put all of that together as a continent, we have some way to go. Our level of overall commitment is still not the best. There's still room for improvement. And on our, in terms of our implementation readiness, there's still a lot of room for improvement. We also notice, for example, that some countries that are extremely committed to the process have very low implementation readiness. Whereas some countries that are not very committed to the process have very high implementation readiness. And, and the report lays out you know, some of these countries. So, so for example, if you take a country like Mali and Togo, they've got, they are among the most committed countries to the AFCFTA process. But if you check their implementation capacity, they are not amongst the most ready. Perhaps if you look at another set of countries, uh, you know, like Botswana, Tanzania, you know, the few other countries uh, that Morocco, for example, that have very high implementation capabilities. If you if you look at their commitment, they are not amongst the most committed. What I tell you is that if the CFT were to take off, it's possible that some of the countries that are not really committed may be among those that will benefit the most. 
right? So you don't have, you know, a perfect correlation between commitment and readiness. These are some of the areas in which we need to mobilize resources, the African Union, other key regional bodies like the African Development Bank and the African Exim Bank need to come together and support the most committed countries to build their implementation capacity so that they can also benefit from their commitment. It's extremely important um, that the countries that show commitment are also the ones who have the capacity to benefit from, from the AFCFTA when it starts. This is actually very interesting. Uh, very, very interesting, really uh, relevant point that you've made there. And I think um, for me, the takeaway from what you just said is, is the fact that those who are committed are not necessarily ready, and those who are ready are not very committed. But I think it's a, it's a nice starting point, and, and I believe just under 50%, it's, it's low, but it's still quite good, uh, given the, the fact that I think the continent has, has come a long way. And yes, we, we start, and as we start, uh, things will begin to fall in place as this whole uh, trade agreement um, goes ahead. So that's still very positive. Uh, very Absolutely. positive. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Collins. I know, um, so for, for Collins, uh, who's uh, from a supply chain uh, background, uh, the president of um, the Ghana Institute of Procurement, uh, I want to understand from your angle, uh, what are the money laundering vulnerabilities as a result of the level of preparedness? And if you can give examples around uh, the vulnerable types of goods, um, and probably like systems, uh, you know, area examples around trade finance, all of that would be really useful. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Well, okay, so from here, I'll start from the economy side because as supply chain, if, they, uh, if supply chain is down, economy is down. You look at uh, the, the global GDP growth, the expected GDP growth globally, to around 3.3 percent but now it is slowing to below 2.9 africa is um uh, 3.2 that was the expected uh, gdp for africa but now it's expected to go lower than 1.8 my country ghana it was growing last year this year it was expected our gdp was expected to go by 6.8%. Now we are expecting maybe 2.6. So from that side, it shows that post COVID or even now, it shows that every every manager of the economy or of a corporate setup is hungry because during the COVID, uh, there's a total global disruption of um, uh, what do you call it? supply chain, less investments, and um, disruption in business per se. So post COVID, there are a lot of issues that are going to happen because every country, every business person want to grow. So we're going to see banking. <clears throat> banking, I don't think they are not going to put on their restrictions because during COVID, there wasn't any deposit coming in, no funds coming into the banking sector. So are they now going to look at uh, where monies are coming from, where business people, investors are now bringing the money to your banks? Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, fictitious uh, supplies, both import and export side. Also under invoicing and uh, over invoicing, there's going to be a lot of FDIs, that's uh, foreign direct investment. And do you think if the FDIs are coming, any economic minister will try to do due diligence and tell you that, hey, look, where you are bringing your money, you, it's, it's dirty and therefore don't bring it to my country. Measures and acquisitions are going to come up. A lot of pseudo companies are going to come up to come and consume other real business people because everybody is what struggling to grow and therefore if somebody comes from anywhere and say look i have this money i want to buy your company people will throw the companies out for them there will be tax holidays people are going to take advantage of that they come and set up 
as you give them five years or uh, 10 years tax holiday, they make the money before uh, the time comes, they sell it out, they go away. Is there clean money or not? Also, regulators are going to, I don't, I don't want to say they are going to, regulations are going to be a bit um, slow because if you are, if you are um, a central bank, if you are a stock exchange uh, uh, CEO, and monies are coming in, okay, are you going to throw all that away? So because of COVID, now everybody will be hungry to rush to develop the economy, to bring the economy back. And therefore, we may lose the ball at the screening side, sanctions, screening, due diligence, in all these areas. And I believe that as um, government, as uh, business people, as professionals, even though we will be hungry to develop our country, grow our companies, to bring back the country to where we expected them to be, we need to keep closer eyes on some of these uh, products and some of these deals that will come across. Wow, you, you, you made a very, very interesting point there. And um, like you said, there will be a little bit of compromise when it comes to uh, compliance, due diligence, uh, checks, because of the, uh, the, the huge sort of economic impacts that um, COVID-19 has caused on the continent. And so, of course, if you're a British uh, business or an investor or a bank, um, even within Africa or outside Africa, it is, you are definitely right. You have to keep a closer eye. There's something that you also mentioned, um, Collins, offline about uh, these whole shell companies that are likely, uh, you know, you mentioned that now with COVID-19, you know you can set up a university without having a physical uh, uh, building. And I think, again, this is also going to be more common now with banks. Uh, I know yeah. right now within, within um, in the UK here and, and this part of the world, you know, shell banks is a, it's a big no-go zone that you couldn't do any... Um, trade or any sort of business relationship with a shell bank. But again, is this going to be the norm going forward with COVID-19, with everything going online, with um, companies um, can almost get away right now with not having a physical presence? So that is something that uh, I would also encourage uh, our participants that have joined those in, uh, in the business banking sector, investors, to pay a closer eye that you potentially could be dealing with a shell bank. And if the regulations are likely to be more relaxed, then this could be um, a, a little bit of an issue uh, that will cause, I would say that investors will need to keep a closer eye, a much closer eye than probably before. So thank you very much uh, for that. That's really, really a valid point that you've made there. Uh, thank you. And so I'm going to go back to you again, Collins, for the next question. And my question is, to what extent can the vulnerabilities then be exploited by illicit actors? You touched on it briefly. But if you can give us some um, some really good examples, that'd be really good. Thank you. Right. Um, I think we are all vulnerable during and post COVID, and therefore we should look at certain areas that ropes. Let me put that ropes may also use to enter into the economy, whether uh, uh, bad or whether illegally or something. For example. Everybody is jumping over the supply of PPEs. Where are mm -hmm. these people coming from? Who are producing them? Are they using child labor? If you don't even take care, people will go and take used PPEs, wash them, label them, and bring it to my continent, Africa. So we need to also check that. Medical supplies and devices, now everybody is open. So every country is waiting for support. Are we having cheap drugs? Are they going to be better? Where are they produced? How is it being produced? Is the prices that they are quoting? Is it the right price? The people that are behind the supply, who are these people? Are they going to throw out there to just get support and influence government and business people? to make their money within Africa. IT items, IT items as a procurement person, it is something that pricing it 
is quite tricky. So somebody says, okay, I am bringing, I'm supplying this IT items because you cannot import or now everybody is um, producing internally and supporting the economy. So if somebody walks to Ghana and say that, okay, I have IT, how would you know that the capacity and the pricing that they are giving is the right one? Because if iPad is there, if iPhone is there, it is the price is based on the capacity, not the size, not the design. So uh, if gig can be sold to you in a price, but we have the 512 capacity, the 128 capacity. So that one too is an area that we need to look at. Food and relief items. Now, recently I read somewhere that how are we even storing our food? Because now we've seen that post COVID, we need to produce our own food and process them. If you produce agricultural uh, products, where are you going to keep them? So people may come in with a lot of support. Business people will create businesses saying that I'll keep, I, I have a warehouse here, bring all your cocoa, bring all your cassava plantain and all that. So you will get a lot of business people springing up. They just have a pseudo business, three months time they collapse to wash their money. So yes, economic managers are open. Now I would say that we are all vulnerable because if you are an economic manager, you want your economic and your, your economy to grow. And therefore anybody brings any business, I think the minister will even tell the regulators, hey guys, take your time, allow the business people to work. But for all you know, three months, four months time, they fold it up because they've been able to wash whatever they brought in. Development projects, development projects, I'm talking about the capital one, um, high rise buildings will come up, public private partnership agreement are going to come up because the government is stressed within the economy, people are stressed. So if somebody comes as a private man to say that, okay, government, I want to support you, raise your money in this sector, energy sector, processing sector, manufacturing sector, it will be given, but you might not know what is behind. Um, employment creating initiatives. You know, during COVID, a lot of people have lost their jobs, and therefore we will just open our doors for every any businessman who wants to create jobs. But people can be and living on the internet, people can even create recruiting centers, take people's money for registration. And by the after a month, you go onto the net, then you hear push, it's gone. They've taken people's money for registrations and all that. Manufacturing sector, construction sector, and all. Again, another thing that is going to come up. Foreign aid it comes, but at times when you go, my brothers will know that's why I believe that they are fighting for Africa to trade among us. Or because some of the foreign aid that do come, you see that it creates jobs for the country where the aid is coming from. People don't get anything, even at times the quality of the work that they come and do. But at the end of the day, the country comes in to pay. Are you getting the point? Uh, finally, I will mention another area that uh, when you look at it, it wouldn't come here. NGOs, non-governmental organizations are going to spring up. anti covert PPE, they form a, an office. They say we are supporting this, but at the end of the day, they will be doing their own thing. So these are some of the areas that business people, economic managers, and all of us professionals, we need to look at so that we can wedge our countries from some of these things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. This is uh, it's, it's a real eye opener, I think, for uh, many of our audience on here. We're getting a lot of questions coming in, and um, I will go to uh, I will ask I will go to one of the questions, and then we'll go um, back into our final question before we round out uh, round up this webinar. So uh, there's quite a couple of questions coming in, and uh, one of them is saying, one of them is saying that given that a cornerstone of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is 
the free movement of goods and people, with the emerging fear of disease exemplified by COVID-19 severely hinder our efforts? I think this has pretty much been answered already, but I will ask uh, Michael to take this question. No, this is one of the big fears. I mean, um, most of the borders in the continent are already shut, as you, as you can see. And so this fear of disease, uh, uh, crossing borders and that, it's, it's gonna be with us for a long time. And we're gonna have to find ways to deal with it. I mean, flights are grounded. You can't even get a flight to go anywhere because people are scared to fly and countries are scared to allow flights to come in. Because if you look at the trend of the COVID infections, initially majority of the cases were imported cases. So this is, you know, it's, it's still in, uh, uh, people haven't forgotten this. This is going to take a while. However, th the, the point is that going forward, uh, there's going to be an, hopefully there's going to be an end to COVID. Hopefully we would have a, a world after COVID. If we don't, if we don't get a world after COVID, we're going to have to learn to live with COVID. Uh, and either way, life has to go on. And, and so uh, these initial moments, people are, you know, very risk averse, but after a while, uh, trade is going to pick up again, the borders are going to be open, uh, trade and logistics is going to pick up again, and we're going to find ways and creative ways to live with the situation. I think the important thing, the important thing is that, and I think Collins alluded to some of them, uh, much of what Collins spoke about was actually the the other side of the opportunity side of COVID. A lot of what he said was actually alluding to the fact that there'll be a lot of opportunities that come with COVID around investments and new business opportunities, but they come with a lot of risk and we have to be careful. And, and so um, some of the things that we need to be aware of as Africans is that COVID is opening a lot of business opportunities. A lot of business opportunities, many of them, that originate from within the continent. Many of them will come from outside the continent. The opportunities to start manufacturing a lot of the things that we used to import, uh, not just medical and pharmaceuticals, uh, but as global supply chains have been disrupted, uh, practically every kind of good product that we typically import to Africa, uh, we, we're finding creative ways to provide them locally. And so if global supply chains have been disrupted, one of the good things about COVID is that it's in fact as some experiment or some sort uh, for many countries that previously were import dependent to all of a sudden find creative ways to meet uh, local demand through local production. And if we can do that in a state of emergency, if we can do more local manufacturing and local production in a state of emergency, why can't we do it in normal times? And so there are clear opportunities for our entrepreneurs from our SMEs, from our businesses, our manufacturers, and our producers to use the COVID experiments and work with governments to get the right government policies and support so that we can localize more production, we can localize more manufacturing, we can localize more supply chains and be able to insource a lot of the production that we previously outsourced to distant uh, manufacturers like China and India, et cetera. So, um, we have to be very careful about the risk that Colin spoke about, um, but we don't have to run away from the opportunities. If we can balance the, the pursuing the opportunities with a, a very open eye to many of the risks that he has spoken about, then we will be able to, uh, in many ways, uh, turn the situation around because there's a silver lining. And it would be unfortunate for us to go through this without maximizing the opportunities that we also brings. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So basically, I think what I'm hearing from everybody is the due diligence aspect of, of uh, you know, any investment. It is so, so, so important that you do sufficient due diligence. But having said that, the opportunities are there. And with the right due diligence, you can take advantage of the opportunities and to minimize uh, the risk. Um, there are still other questions coming, and um, I would encourage my participants to keep sending the questions in. Uh, we're going to go to a final question um, that I have for my panel, and then we'll go to the participants' questions uh, to try and answer them. We've got 15 minutes left. So the last question, which is going to go to all of you, and I'll start with Richard, is what 
can investors uh, do? So what, what can investors both within Africa, so African investors and foreign investors, do to minimize the risk and take advantage of the opportunities? That is, uh, Michael, you've touched on it a little bit, but I'm going to go uh, to each one of you uh, from your own perspective. I know um, Collins is supply chain, so you may have a different angle uh, to come in from. So Richard, um, over to you, thank you. Richard, I think you're mute. Richard, please go ahead. Okay, I think we, we lost Richard there. So I'm going to go to Collins and then we'll come back to Richard later. So Collins, uh, if you can give us uh, your uh, perspective in terms of what can investors do, what advice would you give to investors? Both sure. within well, I'll, I'll come from it from two perspectives. One, I mean, but it has an under, underly, underlying um, layer, which I'll call the diaspora. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the foreign investors... Um, can you hear me now? We're having a little bit of a technical issue. I don't know whether it's... Okay, we can hear you. Okay, so Richard, you go ahead then. Yeah, can, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. We, we lost you again. We've lost you, Richard. So we will go to Collins. We've lost you, Richard. So we'll come back to you again. And so Collins, we'll go straight to you and we'll come back to Richard after Collins. Please go ahead, um, um, Collins. Okay, so what I would say is that investments, uh, anybody coming in, whether local or foreign, you need to respect the country's laws and the regulations get if you are bringing the money yes but you need to make sure that you get your registration you get to all the regulators you get your regulation approved then you can start business when you are coming to uh you can go through your attaches to your embassies i'm talking about the foreign guys investors that are coming so that they will be um shown the way they will be led okay to... can you hear me now mm -hmm. wonderful okay so like i was saying I, to the EI perspective. I think i think it's just a technical issue it's it's kind of like yeah. a playback from his computer so please go ahead colin okay so um uh, investors yes we need them we need them and uh like michael said after COVID there are a lot of opportunities that are opening for everybody we need to take advantage of that and now we've seen we've seen that we've seen that a lot of businesses are going to be virtual a lot of businesses are going to be virtual so people can invest in that area also like i i, I keep on saying it's risky doing business and people should also bring clean business uh, they shouldn't take advantage of certain systems. We have to all be ethical. Uh, if you are doing business, don't just say that everything is about profit. It's about resources that you are gathering for yourself. We have to be ethical and so that you, you become a better corporate a citizen of every African country that you join. But yeah. first of all, I would say that when you come into the country, go through the proper channels and don't be too smart because from where i sit i have a lot of issues where people come in and because they are in africa they think they can have everything that they want to have and um they pay monies to people then later when they get to the regulators and the right channel they think that hey they wouldn't even have paid anything to get whatever approvals that they needed or wanted so when you can go through the proper channel and let us innovate come out with different ideas and we turn it into businesses and um, make money for ourselves and our nations so that our 
individual country GDPs. Now the GDP is not only Africa. Everywhere around the globe is uh, taking a hit, and therefore we have to become better and ethical corporate citizens for Africa and the world as a whole. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Collins. Thank you for that. That's, that's really good advice. Uh, Richard, are you? It's your uh, it's your platform. Is, is it better now? The issues that we we're having earlier. Okay, I think it's still the same. I can't hear Richard. So, Michael, I'm going to go to you uh, very quickly. Uh, what advice can you give to our audience in terms of what what investors can do to minimize the risk and take advantage of the opportunities? Thank you. Okay, so I, I think that investors and entrepreneurs and business people need to look at the world differently, especially if you're playing in Africa. Um, COVID has disrupted a lot of things. Uh, but a lot of things are still not very clear because we're still in, in firefighting mode. So I think that in a few months' time, a lot of business people and entrepreneurs are going to wake up all of a sudden and realize that the landscape that they thought they were they were observing isn't what it is. Um, and if you listen carefully to many of the things Colin said, even whilst the crisis is on and we're firefighting, a lot of very shrewd investors and business people are taking advantage. Deals are being made, all kinds of uh, transactions are being signed, all kinds of financing schemes are being hatched, and people are reallocating resources. Investors and business people are reallocating resources. So it's important to look at the situation today, but also try and project into the future. And nobody can, can really uh, I predict what the situation will be next year or the year after next year. But I think in terms of business trends and, and dynamics, it's possible to, to spot some of the new trends that are emerging. So, okay, for, for investors and business people in Africa, I was saying that this is, number one, this is a time for partnerships, strategic partnerships, extremely important. Um, There's a time for speed, that's number two, uh, because the, the nature of, and the dynamics of, and the moving targets uh, of, of, of the crisis situation and the, and the kinds of opportunities that are opening up have very limited windows. Now, if, if, you, if you are trying to capitalize on certain market niches that have become available now simply because global supply is unable to continue to supply, you have a very limited window uh, in, within which you can capture this opportunity. If the situation stabilizes and global supply chains resurrect, um, it's going to be extremely difficult for, for you to, to stay competitive. So this is the time, the, the market opportunities you need to capture, the, 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 and you need to move very fast. In order to be able to move very fast, you need partnerships. You need partnerships to be able to mobilize the resources that you need very quickly to mobilize the capabilities that you need very quickly in order to be able to deploy, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's um, uh, any other sectors, you need to mobilize resources very quickly to be able to deploy. And to be able to do that, you need partnerships. So I would say that speed is number one, because the window of opportunity is limited, but to be able to move very quickly, you need to build the right partnerships that allow you to be able to do these things very quickly before the, the global supply chains begin to uh, resurrect again, because when they resurrect, uh, they're going to come back really, really strong. Uh, they're going to come back really strong. And they're going to come back in a way that is different from what we're used to. So that will be my, uh, my important message to, to business people in Africa and entrepreneurs and investors who are working on deals in the continent. Thank you, uh, Michael, for that. Uh, Richard, uh, are you okay to go ahead now, or we're still having issues? Can you hear us? Can you hear me, Richard? Okay, I think Richard is still having technical issues. So I think, um, let me go straight to, uh, so Michael, thank you for that. And Richard, um, I think, yeah, we, we can't hear you, so apologies for that. I'm going to go straight to the questions. We've got uh, just about five minutes to the end of this. And so we have other questions coming through. And the next question that I have here is,
So someone says, please, I'd like to know the opportunity that exists for young graduates in commerce in this agreement <laughs> and which areas are more beneficial. I'm not sure whether, <laughs> who wants to go out, who wants to pick this question? I don't know whether Collins, you want to pick this question up. Okay, I think Collins is also frozen. We're having a little bit of a technical issues here. So that's left with you, Michael, to then try well, to answer. For the young graduates, was the question around commerce? Yeah, so a, a young graduate uh, wants to know the opportunity that exists in this agreement, especially a, um, a graduate in commerce. I'm sure that's an opportunity. Well, I, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but for young graduates, uh, the, the opportunities you could look at it if you're an entrepreneur, um, there are going to be opportunities to trade across the continent and depending on the product that you, you produce or the kind of uh, services that you produce. Because this is, is trade not just in goods, but trading goods and services. So it would be important to, um, you know, regardless of the, of the product or the service in which you, you deal, to look at the opportunities around the continent and take advantage of them. In terms of employment, um, the way it works is that there's going to be opportunities for free movement of goods, of services, of capital, and of labor. So, so, so labor mobility is one of the key aspects of the CFTA, which means that if you live in Zambia and there's a job opportunity in Kenya, you should be able to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. You can take advantage of it in two ways. You may either move to, to Kenya to take advantage of the opportunity, or if it's the kind of a services opportunity that allows you to be able to execute it remotely, you should be able to do that. Now, under the AFCFTA and the protocol for trading services, there are going to be certain changes that makes it a lot easier, a lot cheaper for you to take advantage of that job opportunity in another South African country. Uh, opportunities around tax issues, for example, are going to be uh, are going to improve a lot more. So um, the details of of the agreement, obviously, when it is finalized and published, uh, would would bring more clarity to all of us. But in terms of young graduates, these are some of the opportunities I, I, can, I can talk about. Thank you very much, um, Michael, for this. Okay, so we're going to go to our next poll, uh, the next question, uh, very quickly, and I am launching the poll now. So please, uh, all my attendees, if you can, uh, let's try and answer this question, uh, which says, do you think free movement of goods will bring additional costs and or benefits to goods um, and put pressure on local services. In the meantime, we also have an uh, opportunity to take one more question. So if anybody would like to uh, send the question in, that would be really good. We'll endeavor to answer that as well. Thank you very much. So far, in terms of this uh, question, the poll, the 8% is saying strongly agree, 50% agree, 17% uh, strongly disagree, 17% is neutral, 8% disagree. We'll, we'll give it another few seconds. Okay, so it's a, it's a little bit of, uh, uh, so the 44% says they agree, and the next higher one is the 19% which disagree, so it's uh, very, uh, yeah, the, the, the winner is the agree one, which is the 44%, but it's kind of, it's not like the other one, it's it's different, so each, each sex, so it's disagree 13%, uh, 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 sorry, strongly disagree 13%, disagree 19, neutral is 13, and strongly agree 13. So it's a it's it's a it's an interesting one here. But I'd like to first of all say a very big thank you uh, to all the uh, my panel, uh, Mr. Collins. A very big thank you to you for uh, taking your precious time to join us. Uh, I'm getting some feedback already on my phone and um, emails to say this is extremely relevant conversation, very useful. Uh, they've learned a lot. And I'd like to also thank you, um, Michael, as well, for uh, joining us uh, as a panel. 
really, really useful uh, insights, as well as Richard, as well, both of you and your excellent Afro Champions uh, Year Zero report on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's brilliant. So this has been a really useful uh, conversation. And I would say that uh, to conclude, what I um, uh, the takeaway is really the due diligence angle uh, that there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, but there will also come these opportunities will come with its own risk. Some of the risk is uh, a risk that will probably it's it's an emerging risk that it's coming with COVID-19. Uh, the same way there's going to be emerging opportunities that it's only uh, COVID-19 opportunities that wasn't uh, didn't exist before. So we all have to be very um, careful in terms of um, keeping a very close eye. We need to keep a close eye when it comes to due diligence. Due diligence is key. And of course, Africa is not one country. Uh, it's the 54 countries in the continent. Each country is different. Each industry is different. So you will need a special um, uh, insight in order to understand uh, the culture and how things work. And so uh, that's very, very key. Thank you all. Uh, join us again next month. Uh, we will send further information uh, there. We're also going to be launching our very first um, virtual summit in August. And we'll be looking at um, how the continent can attract and sustain investment post-COVID-19 and what role compliance play. So stay tuned. Uh, further information uh, will be coming forth. And if you want to know more about what we do, uh, EBII, uh, please send us an email at um, inquiry at ebiigroup.com, inquiry at ebiigroup.com. And the EBI group, we have the EBI compliance, we have EBI invest in Africa forum, we also have EBI leadership forum. And uh, coming soon, we will have the EBI foundation. So thank you all once again for joining us. And I wish you a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.